Well, it is out of Joshua, but as I was talking to Marnie, my wife, um, I told her what I was going to be doing, and she said, well, it's way too much. <laughs> so I cut it in half. Now, we'll be looking at Joshua chapter 5, and there's a question that I want you to be thinking about. There's actually a question and also something to observe. The question is, how are you doing with the Lord? How are you doing with the Lord? How is your relationship with him? And the flip side of that, how's the Lord doing with you? <laughs> is he looking at you as a precious servant of the king to whom he is going to say, well done? Or is he looking at you and saying, worthless slave? Is he looking at you, and, and I don't want this to sound like a guilt trip, because it isn't, but I just ask an honest question. You know, Thanksgiving, Christmas, the new year, is often a time of reflection where we get to sit back and say, how's the year been? And what's the year look like? And at that, those times of reflection, the question of what is God doing in your life? What is he calling you to? What is... What has he been asking you to do? And maybe you've said, next week. Or, you know, I'm awful comfortable here. I'm not sure I want to do it. So be thinking about those things as we talk today. You know, I, I have this tie. I, I didn't intentionally put this on, but I thought about it as I was putting it on. I just, you know. I call it my Solomon Islands tie because it has little palm trees on it and I actually bought it to wear because every, every time I would go, they, I would preach in a church on the Sunday morning. Um, I would be a guest preacher somewhere and I never knew where and some of the places were a bit remote and a little tough. Um, nothing like 95 degrees, 90% 90 humidity and wearing a long sleeve shirt <laughs> with a tie. Um, but it's a process that I had to ask that same question about. And so when I was presented with that opportunity to spend the next four years going there every six months and training, um, there was a lot of me that said, boy, that recliner really is comfortable. And air conditioning is a wonderful thing, as is electricity, by the way, and clean water. So um, I don't want it to be, sound like judgmental or guilt tripping or any of these other things. What I want you to do is reflect. You personally, because you will stand before the king and you will account for your life. You're not going to account for somebody else's life. Each of your children who is redeemed by the Lord God will stand on their own not because of their mom's faith or their dad's faith or their uncle's faith, but they will stand before God. All of you will stand before God who believe and account for the life you've given. And those who are unredeemed will stand before the great, great white throne. The books will be opened and they will be judged. So keep that in mind as we look at Joshua. Now, we know that Joshua was a man that uh, is prominent in the scripture, a man who, at the time of Moses leading Israel, was the man who went in to spy out the land and came back along with Caleb and said, let's go. What are we standing around for? And yet, the nation of Israel, the men said, no. No, we're not going there. And they were condemned for the next 
40 years to wander, as you shared, to wander in the wilderness. And we're going to see that reflected on in the beginning of Joshua chapter 5. So let's turn there, if you have your Bibles with you. Now it came about that when all the kings of the Amorites who were beyond the Jordan to the west and all of the kings of the Canaanites who were by the sea heard how the Lord had dried up the waters of the Jordan before the sons of Israel until they had crossed, that their hearts melted and they were no longer, there was, I'm sorry, there was no spirit in them any longer because of the sons of Israel. Now Joshua has crossed the Jordan. He has led the people of Israel to this place. And we look at him and say he was unquestionably obedient to the call that God had given Moses. He didn't doubt it. He didn't question it. And what is interesting is that as he, in the first four chapters, as he leads the people of Israel across the Jordan River, it's a miraculous event that occurs, and you hear none of the grumbling that you heard from the nation 40 years earlier. No, we can't do this. No, we're not going to do this. They were condemned to 40 years in the wilderness because of their unwillingness to follow the promise. God had said to the nation of Israel, Hence I have said to you, you are to possess their land, and I myself will give it to you to possess it, a land flowing with milk and honey. I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the people. And later on we hear the confirmation in 1 Kings, Blessed be the Lord who has given rest to his people Israel according to all that he promised. Not one word has failed of all his good promise, which he promised through Moses his servant. Joshua is responding to the promise of God, and God is already at work. He had said, I will give you the land. And he's already at work. Joshua's crossed the Jordan. He's taken the first step. He's sitting there in a little corner in the southeast portion of the nation of Israel that is being given this promised land with his people. Watch the miracle happen, but he's still sitting there in the corner, and God is already working in the hearts of the Canaanites and the Hittites and the Amorites before Joshua ever got there. And that's what he's doing for us. We need to recognize that when God makes a promise to his people, he will fulfill it, and he has already gone ahead, and he struck terror in the hearts of the Amorites and the Canaanites. They have no spirit left in them. That's an act of God in the hearts of men. We can hear about great victories or whatever and say, hey, yeah, but they haven't, they haven't played us yet. You know, the football team that says, yeah, they're good, but they haven't played us yet. But instead, God has already worked in the hearts of men that there was no spirit left in them. There was no fighting spirit. It was fear. It was absolute terror that was going on in this nation which they had been given to conquer. So we have a rebellious generation that refuses to accept the promise that, that God gave them, and they walked in the wilderness until they died. And I reflected back on that question when I asked it to you. What is God doing in your life? God always goes before and prepares the way and calls us to follow. Read Ephesians chapter 2. The works he's prepared for us, that we might walk in them. He prepares the way for us and asks us to trust him by faith. Now Steve's been teaching by faith. Saving faith. Good teaching. And he, I think he's going to be teaching on it for a little while longer, so it seems. But saving faith. Faith 
is believing God, trusting him, and walking in obedience. And that message is consistent from Abraham, from Genesis 1, through Abraham to Revelation. That is a consistent message. It isn't a new message. It's a new covenant. It's a new promise because Jesus has paid the price. But the process of walking by faith, the Old Testament saints believed God and it was accounted to them as righteousness. They believed by faith and walked in it. Jeremiah didn't have a real good time, but he trusted God, believed, and walked. And that's what Joshua has now done. God said it, I believe it, by faith I walk in it, and he's watching God who has already done the work. And he's walking in those works and watching it happen. That's where we want to be in our lives. That's where we want to be in our lives. We want to walk by faith, watching where God is working and getting alongside it. Whether it's next to your children and that next step of faith that they, they need to take to make it theirs. Whether it's something, something else, whatever God has in your life. But reflect on that as we speak. Jesus said, if you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy would be made full. Obedience has always been an act of response to the love of God, not an act of earning God's favor or as the nation of Israel grumbled as they walked to and then through the wilderness, grumbling the whole time. Our obedience should never come out of a heart of grumbling, of, eh, well, I have to do this. Christ talks about joy. You want to experience the joy of the Lord? Walk in obedience to what he says with a heart of love that is responding to the love that you have received from God. In verse 2, at the time, the Lord said to Joshua, make for yourself flint knives and circumcise again the sons of Israel a second time. So Joshua made himself flint knives and circumcised the sons of Israel at uh, Gilbreath Heraloth. This is the reason why Joshua circumcised them. All the people who came out of Egypt, who were males, all the men of war, died in the wilderness along the way after the, they came out of Egypt. For all the people who came out were circumcised, but all the people who were born in the wilderness along the way uh, as they came out of Egypt had not been circumcised. For the sons of Israel walked 40 years in the wilderness until the nation, that is, the men of war, who came out of Egypt perished because they did not listen to the because they did not listen to the voice of the Lord, to whom the Lord had sworn that he would not let them see the land which the Lord had sworn to their fathers to give us, a land flowing with milk and honey. Their children, whom he raised up in their place, Joshua circumcised, for they were uncircumcised because they had not circumcised them along the way. Circumcision. Uh, Joshua, I have one question. How's that going to make me a better fighter? If we're supposed to take this land, you're telling me this act is going to help us to take this? What, is it going to make me stronger? It's going to make me smarter? It's going to make, make me a better warrior? Did you hear any of that? I mean, circumcision has nothing to do with fighting, walking, war, anything else. Circumcision was a sign of separation. Circumcision was a sign of separation. In that verse that I read to you from Leviticus 20:24, 20, I am the Lord your God who has separated you from the peoples. Cir circumcision was a physical act that was a sign of separation. 
that this was God's chosen people, and this would be a physical sign, and an act of obedience that we were to do as the nation of Israel. Now, later on, we'll talk about in our context to salvation by faith, how all this all comes together. But for now, we know that that was given as a sign of separation. They would be different by what they ate, by, by their appearance. They would be different than the rest of the peoples. And in God's instruction, he was saying that you will be different and people will look at you and see you as a people that are blessed and say, who is your God? I look at your blessing, who is your God? That's what I want to know because I see you being blessed and I want, I want that blessing too. You'll see as we go through this so many consistencies in the message that will carry over to the message of salvation in our conduct. So the, the act was carried out without grumbling, without question. Why? Because this was a generation that was obedient to the call of God. And if God said, do it, do it. It may not make sense. Guess what? And we won't talk much about it, but in chapter 6, walking around a fortress of amazing thickness of walls, um, and it's shut up, and the, the gates are closed. There's no way you're going to get in there, and they walk around. Oh, that makes sense. Walk around the building for seven days, and it's going to fall down. Sure. But we need to understand, this was a nation committed to doing what God said, a leader and leadership committed to doing what God said and not questioning whether it made sense to them. It made sense to a holy God who created the universe. Figure it out, guys. He's going to go before you and give you the victory. And so they were circumcised. Now when they had finished circumcising all the nation, they remained in the places in the camp until they were healed. Then the Lord said to Joshua, listen to these words, today I have rolled away the reproach of Egypt from you. So the name of that place is called Gilgal to this day. And Gilgal means rolled away. So what did God do in response to their obedience? He took away the sin of disobedience that the nation of Israel displayed in not walking by faith into the promised land that God had given to them. God did this and said, this is what I, you were obedient, I'm going to do this. We need to understand. So much of God's promise is about him doing it from the time of the covenant with Abraham when he walked between the sacrifices. One God walking between, not God and Abraham, God, I will do it. Here, I will do it. The picture that we have of rolled away reminded me First of all, of Ezekiel and the rolling wheels and the coals that were inside them, the burning coals. And the burning coals were to cleanse. We have fire, we have cleansing. Isaiah was touched in Isaiah 6 by the burning coals, that sign of cleansing that occurs. And now God cleanses the nation of Israel from their disobedience. And again, another connection I would like us to make. Where else have we heard rolled away? Think about that. While the sons of Israel camped at Gilgal, they observed the Passover on the evening of the 14th day of the month on the desert plains of Jericho. On the day after the, well, okay, so let's stop there. So they observed the Passover in obedience to God. Again, God 
gave the ordinance to Moses to give to the people that they were to celebrate the Passover every year. And what is the symbol of the Passover? Freedom. The nation of Israel experienced freedom on the day of the Passover. They were released from their slavery, set free to be a nation of God's people. And they were to remember it, and their children were to be taught it, and to remember it every year as the symbol of their freedom. God setting his people free. On that day after the Passover, on that very day, so they've experienced their freedom, now they, they have entered the land, they have experienced the circumcision set apart, they've experienced the celebration of the freedom given, giving God the glory for freeing them, and now the day after, the very day after that freedom, what happens on the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate some of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on that day after they had eaten some of the produce of the land, so that the sons of Israel no longer had manna, but they ate some of the yield of the land of Canaan during that year. The manna stopped. What, was God denying them something? No. They were now tasting the milk and honey that God had promised them. I told you this is a land of milk and honey. Enjoy it. This is for you. You don't need the manna anymore. You, don't, you are not under the condemnation of the generation that refused to obey. You are experiencing the new freedom. You celebrated that freedom, and now you're going to know what it tastes like. That new freedom tastes good. It is the freedom of living in the promised land, a land of milk and honey, and you are beginning to experience that. An affirmation of your walking by faith in the promise. And they didn't need the manna anymore. It's a new generation set apart walking by faith and receiving the affirmation along the way that everything that God said in his promises is true. And now we come to the sorry just one Okay, now it came about that when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, a man was standing opposite him. And his sword was drawn in his hand, and Joshua went to him and said, said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, rather I indeed come now as captain of the host of the Lord. This is by, by the evidence of the, the text, the context in which it is said, this is the pre-incarnate Christ. I know there's some people in some theological circles that, circles that teach that that never happened. But I want, you to give, I want to give you two evidences that it, that it is, in fact, the pre-incarnate Christ standing before Joshua. The first one is in verse 15. The captain of the Lord's host said to Joshua, remove your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. That only happened one other time in the entire of scriptures. Okay, Never ever when an angel appeared did he ever say, take off your sandals, you are on holy ground. Because an angel can't do that. An angel is a servant of the Lord. He's not the Lord. He's the Lord's emissary. He's not the Lord. 
the only, only God can make ground holy. And God appeared to Moses at the burning bush and said, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. And God, the incarnate Christ, appears before Joshua and says, take off your sandals, you're on holy ground. And in chapter 6, in verse 2, it says, the Lord said to Joshua. No angel has ever been referred to as the Lord. So this is the continuation of the thought of the captain of the host of the Lord talking to Joshua at the beginning of chapter 6 and telling him what to do. And he says, and the, the scripture says, the Lord said. So there's two affirmations in the context of these two chapters that this is the captain of the host of the Lord, Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, coming to Joshua. Now, the interesting thing about it is what, how he answers Joshua. You know, remember how Jesus would, would always turn the questions of the Pharisees or the Sadducees or whatever into what he wanted to say? Well, this is an unexpected response. Jesus, the pre-incarnate Jesus, the captain of the host, says... He says, Joshua says, are you for us or for our adversaries? And he says, no. <laughs> Wait a minute. I gave you an A, B choice and you just gave me C. What are you talking about? He didn't answer my question. So ja he says, no. I'm not your adversary. I'm not fighting for you, with you, or against you. I am the captain of the host of the Lord, and we are coming to do our work, which is to give you Jericho. We are going to give you Jericho. What you're going to have to do is walk around it seven days. But you're not going to fight. You're not going to touch one stone. You're not going to have to do anything. I am the captain of the host of the Lord, and the host of the Lord is going to conquer Jericho. You just need to walk in it and trust me. Classic example of walking by faith. The silliest thing in the world. Walk around. That, that, they'll kill us. They'll shoot at us. They'll, that, and seven days later, what do we got? We got a bunch of horns sounding, a bunch of shouting, and nothing happened. They didn't say that. The captain, Christ, the Lord, came to him and said, I am. I'm not an adversary. I'm, not, I'm fighting a, a battle at a completely different level that you're not, in, you're not in. I am the captain of the host of the Lord, and we will march into Jericho, and we will tear the walls down, and you'll watch it happen as an affirmation of your belief. And Joshua fell on his, on his face to the earth and bowed down and said to him, what has my Lord to say to his servant? I have a friend who um, I have been witnessing to for a number of years. And um, he's an intellectual who likes to debate and more or less useless debate because I told him, hey, it is by faith that you will receive this Christ. And, uh, but anyways, he always says, well, the first thing I do when I, uh, when I get to heaven, because, he, you know, everybody gets to heaven. First thing I do, I'm going to ask him who shot John Kennedy. And I said, said to him, well, first of all, you're not going to get to heaven because you don't believe. But if you did get to heaven and you saw God, you'd do the same thing that Joshua did. You're not going to stand before the risen Christ who sits at the right hand of the Father and intellectualize. You're not going to have a chance to say anything. You are going to fall on your face, bow down, 
because of the beauty, the majesty, the power, the glory of the Lord. Think about that now. And think about the opportunity that you have to fall on your face, to bow down, and to say, as Joshua said, what has my Lord to say to his servant? Remember I asked that question at the beginning. What is the Lord saying to you, his servant? Maybe, maybe nothing, because you're not listening because you're not on your face before the Lord saying, by faith I will walk in what you call me to do. What does the Lord have to t say to his servant? It's a heart attitude with which we approach God. And if you're not there, you're not gonna hear. I think of uh, Isaiah and, and Isaiah's the year of King Uzziah in chapter 6, of when he sees the Lord and he says, Woe is me, for I am ruined, because I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Okay, so one of the things I wanted us to think about was we look at this and we know about Joshua conquering the city and going forth and the ban and about Achan breaking the ban and you know the starting to see the seeds of rebellion already in the people of Israel because we can't keep the law the law is not going to save us and I thought what are the parallels that we see in this message of Joshua and the people of Israel to the message of salvation. Because the, if it's true that we can see these parallels, then it's true that biblical theology says we will see Christ. We saw him incarnate standing here. But we will see Christ and the message of salvation throughout scripture because God doesn't change. And so, and I don't know if, I, I hope this is okay. I didn't ask you about it. You know, we don't need a bike. Wherever you saw a parallel to the message of salvation through Jesus Christ, in this message of Joshua, just say it. Say something that struck you that, that you said, well, let me give you the one. Dave, I saw you nodding, so I know you know it already. Um, the stone was rolled away. The words rolled away by God are not typical to what God would say about forgiveness of sin. But he used that term, and Gilgal actually means rolled away. The city still existed. It's mentioned throughout Scripture into the New Testament. Rolled away, we think of the, the stone in the tomb. That the stone was rolled away. The risen Christ now preached freedom by faith from sin by believing in him. And I don't think those words were coincidental. I think the example of the nation of Israel being freed from the sin of their, their fathers who died in the wilderness is that picture of the stone rolled away from the tomb, the risen Christ, who is our hope. Our hope. So what about, do you see any other parallels? Do you see anything that happened in this teaching that would, would you would say, Jesus, the New Testament. I mean, I've got some written down here, but I, I just wondered if you saw any. Because they jumped out at me, so. You use the words predestination. Those he, whom he foreknew, he predestined. God was at work while you were a sinner on the path to salvation. God is, was at work before, before we ever became saved. I went to a Lutheran church. I was unsaved. Went to a Lutheran church, but for some reason, I listened very intently to the liturgy of the Lutheran church, which of course was the same, a very similar liturgy to the Roman Catholic church. 
uh, but just in English. Luther wanted to translate it so they could understand what the priest was saying. And I didn't become a believer until 10, 15 years later, but I still have those passages from the liturgy of the Roman Church, or of the Lutheran Church, ringing in my head that I, I had retained at that age that were simply scriptures. I still remember the, the Lutheran pastor saying, he sang the liturgy, now let us thy servants depart in peace, for mine, mine eyes have seen the glory of the Lord. The, from Simeon, when Jesus is brought to the temple. I have to sing it, or I don't remember it right. And I'm not going to do that, so <laughs> we're safe there. Do not think that I came to abolish the law of the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill the law. So every promise we see made by God is fulfilled in Christ. Like what? Well, how about circumcision? What does he call us to be? Well, we know that, that circumcision no longer means anything, for in Christ Jesus neither... Uh, for in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith working through love. Remember, God called us to be a, a people separate. And what does he tell us through Peter? But you are a chosen race. You are a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. The picture of Israel being the people that God had chosen, the law, the failure, you can't do it, Christ fulfilling the law, you are now that chosen race, that royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. What's your life doing? Is it proclaiming the glories, the excellencies of God to an unsaved people who desperately need everything that God has promised? They celebrated the Passover. The Passover was a picture that Christ fulfilled what did John say? The next day he saw Jesus coming to him and he said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The Passover Lamb, Jesus Christ. The manna. They needed the manna to survive in the wilderness. The promise was that entering into this promised land that they would have the land of milk and honey and they ate of that. Jesus fulfilled the law and said, I am the bread of life who comes to me, he who comes to me will not hunger, and he who believes in me will never thirst. The absolute fulfillment of entering into this promised land, the promised land for us is this kingdom of, of light that we have been transferred into. We are now aliens on this world, living in a world of light and living off of the bread of life, Christ himself. And I want us to see the picture of Christ that we see in Joshua. This isn't the suffering servant come to die. This isn't Christ the baby in a manger in Bethlehem that we will celebrate at Christmas. No. This is the Christ of Revelation. This is the Christ of Revelation. He stood there with a store, sword. He was the captain of the army of, the, of God, of the host of God. And we see that reflected in Revelation when it says, and I saw heaven opened and behold a white horse and he who sat upon it is called faithful and true, and in righteousness 
He judges and wages war. This is the Christ that we see in Joshua. It is the Christ that will come back and that will wage war, and he will have no mercy on those who have rejected him. And that is why the message that we carry in us is so important. We have a message that we can carry to the world, and people will not see this Christ coming on a white horse, waging war against them, but they will see the risen Savior that has given them life for eternity. So I ask you, where does God want you to go? You've got the coming months of re, or month of reflection, of thinking about the blessings, about giving thanks. What's God talking to you about in your life? I don't know what that is. It could be he's calling you to a ministry that you're reluctant to get involved in. Maybe you don't feel adequate. Maybe you're unsure. Is he calling you to, um, to maybe go to someone that you've had trouble with and try to resolve your differences or seek to ask for his forgiveness or her forgiveness? Is he calling you to a simple act of obedience? You know, that man or that woman at work has, you've got an unhealthy relationship with them. You know, too many times you sit down and, and converse, perhaps, and talk about things that only your wife or your husband should hear. Um, you need to just stop that relationship. You need to avoid that person. You need to not walk into that store because when you walk into that store, there's a whole display of magazines with things on it you shouldn't be looking at, and you know it. And you feel guilty, but at the same time compelled. That's your flesh talking. Are you grumbling at God? Are you grumbling because maybe you don't have as much as you want? Maybe you feel let down? We have those moments in our lives when we grumble. We all do. But my question is, where's your heart? Is your heart grump, have a grumbling attitude like the nation of Israel, living in disobedience and wandering in the wilderness until you die? Or is your heart thankful to God in the midst of whatever is going on and giving him the praise and trusting him that he will lead you? He will lead you. Because it is then that you were living out the faith and the opportunity to experience the joy that James talks about. Count it all joy when you encounter. Count it all joy. How can we do that? Walking by faith, trusting God, believing him. The call for your life. And wherever you are, you're 15, you're 50, you're 68, what has God have for you for the rest of your life? Because there's no guarantee in tomorrow. Let's pray. Oh, Father, we thank you. We thank you for the example of Joshua walking by faith, trusting you. And we pray that in our lives, we could, in the same way, Walk in this coming year by faith, trusting in you, believing that you will supply in every way that you have promised. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen.